everyone. Welcome to the latest edition of Client Horror Stories. And I'm very excited to have Bonnie Rothman with me today. This, this interview has been long in the making with a lot of back and forth because we're uh, we both, we both been busy, but I'm happy to finally have you, have you here, Bonnie. It's, uh, it's great to be here, Morgan. And uh, let's jump right into your story. And I'm sure that telling the story, lots of lessons and ideas will, will come out. What, what tell us about the challenging experience and what you've learned from it? Wow, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> I work with um, a lot of um, high growth companies, and you know the stock and trade is really helping um, founders and sometimes with or without marketing teams tell their stories. And uh, I've worked with a lot of exciting businesses at numerous stages of their growth. And I think that um, one of my favorite stories is from one of my favorite clients of all time. And um, they were uh, a very, very well-funded, super cool company in um, that uh, their, pro their brand promise was um, a, a home chef delivery service. So instead of a meal kit, you would subscribe just as you would to Blue Apron and a chef would bring their little, this, this meal that you chose to your door, prepare everything, clean up, put the meal on the table and go. And you, you know, wow. you a bit, right. I want that. Right, right. I know it was such a fabulous promise. And um, it was in uh, the, the company was based in New York city and they were testing in New York city. They had a, a lot of funding. Um, they had a big staff. Uh, they had a marketing team and a fabulous CEO, really cool offices, really cool promises. And they had kitchens. Um, they were based in Soho, but they had kitchens in Chelsea where the meals were prepared and they were re recruiting lots of personalized chefs and the business was growing. And um, they had cycled through, by the time they came to us, they had cycled through numerous communications agencies. We do storytelling through public relations and lots of messaging and lots of positioning. And we, we were brought on board and the, um, the CEO of the company who had, had, he had, was a Silicon Valley guy, now, now living in New York, um, said to us, you're, you're, you're our third agency and you're by far the best. Because every week we would come in with our, you know, have team meetings, we would work on messaging, or we would work on projects, or we would work on events. And along the way, we did lots of fun things for them. Like we, we, um, there's a rumor in New York City that like a lot of people never turn their ovens on. So we surveyed New Yorkers to find out um, what they put their ovens, you know, what they put in their ovens. And we got responses like shoes and books and, you know, laundry detergent, things like that, which was, you know, it's sort of, you know, when we conduct surveys, what we want to do is um, sort of confirm a previously held belief, um, you know, that's completely outrageous. That's one nice tactic for a survey. So, um, so we did some really good work. We did the survey uh, and found that lots of people stored shoes in their ovens, men and women, surprisingly enough. And uh, we got a lot of nice press for them. That was just one of the many, the many um, activities that we undertook for them. And the CEO said, you know, what can we do for an event? Um, and how can, we, how can we really elevate the brand? And so we came up with this idea of having kitchen sides. We, instead of in, in our business, uh, there's a tactic called desk sides where you trot around and you meet with reporters and influencers at their desks. So we said, we're gonna have kitchen sides where we're gonna go to influencers homes and with our chefs and we're gonna have this experience. So that was all bubbling along and, um, and uh, the influencers love this cute little take. They've got these personal chefs to come to their home. And uh, then, then the CEO said, what else can we do? We said, well, why don't we find sort of the ultimate customer for you? And we, we decided that Allison Williams, who was then in, uh, Brian Williams' daughter, who was then in Girls, the HBO series girls would be the perfect spokesperson. So we're negotiating with, with I forget what, you know, whatever her agent, yeah. her agent in Hollywood, yes. and we're in the mix and we're 
this close to signing her to do publicity for us. And then we, we came in for our weekly call. And again, the CEO was so excited. He said, oh my God, everything is going great. We're, I have great news. We're expanding to Chicago. We're expanding to LA. And now we're, we are getting, we, I have a team of people we used to work with really big brands and we're starting to feel like this is going to be this acceleration point. And we're gonna help this company go, you know, charge into other markets. We're gonna have the opportunity to secure celebrities in every market to do these kitchen sides. And we're planning, planning, planning. And uh, the next week we decided to have our our team meeting via call. And 10 minutes before the team meeting, I get a call from the CEO and he said, I just wanna tell you, we're not gonna be having our team meeting because we're shutting the business down. Ooh. So we were stunned. He might not have been, we had absolutely no clue that the business was in trouble because he was working with his investors. And, um, you know, I, I just like what you and I were talking prior to recording, you know, the investors decided that the business, I, I can only assume because we didn't have a debrief, he, he was devastated as you can imagine. Um, they, they decided that uh, the business wasn't making money fast enough or you know, there, the, the price, uh, maybe the customer acquisition price was too high because as you can imagine, creating, right. um, creating that, that supply yes. chain and finding the individual chefs, yes, it's yes. just a lot of bells and whistles to make that work. And um, the business shut down. And uh, we were blindsided, we were blindsided um, and disappointed because there was no question that um, the stories that we were telling for this brand were differentiated, um, were exciting, were making um, internal people happy, were, were getting attention from the media. Um, we were helping to redefine this category. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, communications can only take a company so far if other things within the company are broken. Um, so that was really disappointing because we were doing so well. Right, right. Um, so, so uh, yeah. So this is, this, this is a, an intense story. I like the buildup. And by the way, I know you professionally do storytelling and hearing this, I'm like, wow, she's telling the story in an exciting way. So it, <laughs> makes, it makes me want to hire you. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> what, one of the great things about your story is I think there are, a couple of interesting lessons that we that we can get from this. So like everyone listening, or, or the target at least for this podcast, are younger versions of ourselves, people 15 years younger than us who are starting their own communication into marketing or really any, any well, sort I'm, of firm. I'm only I'm only and, 25, so <laughs> those those 10 year olds are uh, okay. are very 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 precocious. <laughs> um that um that that i think that, that there are a few great great lessons um from this and 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 one one lesson is it's so easy to really obsess on your one role just marketing user acquisition communications when really like you need to always have your pulse on on the on the on the core of the business uh, business itself like even if the CEO was devastated, he knew the financials, he knew what was happening, so it couldn't have been that much of a surprise to him. So one interesting challenge is how do you befriend the leadership of the company so that, so that, you, can, that you can get this deeper understanding of, uh, um, uh, of, of what's happening in order to prevent you yourself from being blindsided by this? Oh, I agree. Um, you know, I thought that we had a really good rapport, um, which was which was why I, I, I wonder, uh, I wonder if um, he was blindsided because he That's shared, true. you know, in that particular instance, he wasn't a liar. Um, right. He was a business guy. So it, it, the, con the sort of the, the timing of week 
you know, week A, we're expanding to Chicago and LA and week B, we're shutting our doors. <laughs> Something happened. Um, I think that even he didn't know about. I don't think that um, because because he's smart. He came from marketing, so he was smart enough to know that if he told his his mark his com communications company that they were expanding into markets, our next step is okay. Let's build a timeline. Let's figure out what the landscape is in these markets, and let's see how we can replicate what we've done so successfully in New York in these other All markets. Right. So it would have it would have start started a wheel for us of work. So I think I agree that it's really important to really know what's happening in the minds of your clients. I mean, I worked I worked with another start, startup founder um, in very early stages to help him articulate his story. My job was that his story felt all over the place, which is frequently the case um, at the at the beginning stages. He had some funding, a great idea. He had great boosters and great supporters. And um, so I helped him get his story started. It was a, it's a, a workplace development company that um, gets uh, people into sort of these <clears throat> middle income jobs like working on the factory floor in robot repair or um, auto mechanics using um, virtual reality to train so that um, there's, there's it's a lot safer, They're, they get on it, instant feedback. I mean, it's a really brilliant concept. And, and this is a guy with a vision who had success in another area of ed tech. So it was fabulous, um, fabulous promise, fabulous founder. And as we got closer, uh, we, closer to one another, um, at one point I said, okay, you're gonna, you know, we're gonna be rolling out in this particular state and here's what, the communications plan is going to look like in that state. And he kept pushing back and kept pushing back. And I talked to the people in the state and I had all the communications materials ready to go. And then I said, why aren't, you know, I think we can get moving and, and we need to tell our story locally in order to, to move up to this, to get the story nationally. And he said to me, I don't even know if this is going to work. I was like, what? Like I had no idea. No, as it turned out, as it turned out within like two months, it was working. He got more funding. He got, you know, he used the story. He got well-established. He, the, the company was named one of Fast Company's most innovative this year. You know, they're, they're doing great, but it's what, it's, it's what I've seen when I work very, very closely with founders. They have this moment, um, which I call founder flounder. And um, <laughs> I love it. And they have this deer in the headlights, like, oh my God, is this going to work? And am I ready? And um, since I've been there so many times, I'm, I usually can, um, I usually have a sense of when it's going to work. Like in the, in, the, in the case of the workplace development guy, there was like no question that this was just, he had had a, like a bad, maybe had a bad meeting the day before, like there could be all sorts of reasons for that doubt. Um, but it, it took my breath away a little bit in that particular case because he'd seemed so confident. And then you right, see, right. you see the founders exposing their fears, which happens to many entrepreneurs. And you as, a, or me as a, as sort of a communications counselor who's helping them tell their story and founder stories for high growth startups in any business in general is one of their right. biggest assets. So we tend to get very, very close in our exploration of that. Um, I have to, I, I find myself having to be prepared for that. Oh shit, is this not going to work moment? <laughs> So, <laughs> so, and to help them talk them out of it. Oh yeah, I uh, I love that. I love your phrase, the founder flounder. It reminds me in the, of the Joseph Campbell arc of the hero that like right before the big win at the end, there's always like the dragon reappeared just when you think the dragon is dead. It's that Correct. before the big moment, that scary thing that happens and it's largely internal. I um, uh, love it. and. 
And I think part of the trick here is for them to open up to you emotionally, you need a level of trust, a level of time together, personal rapport, personal connection, and, and there's no button you can press to make, so, to make someone be able to open up emotion with you. It's just the hard work of relationship building. It really, really is. And, um, and I think that it's, it's as a service provider, which we are, we, of course, like we all say that, oh, we are, we, we work as your in-house team or some of your partners, but at the end of the day, we're, we're an agency. So it's, you want to be able to, to get there really fast. Um, you, you want to be able to build that trust really fast. Um, you know, and, and I've had that with clients. I've had, you know, I've had the CEO hotline on Sunday afternoons, one of my clients, like it was like Sunday afternoon, 3.30. Oh, here's the CEO calling me again, you know, with something that had nothing to do with communication, yeah. but some, you know, it, 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 maybe it was some internal questioning that he was having, you know, or, or something that, that was do dogging him oh. on the weekend. But, but, you know, I sort of know that I've gotten to that place. Um, not that I encourage my clients to call me at three thirty on a of Sunday course. afternoon. I would much prefer. <laughs> I would much prefer to have my Sunday afternoons <laughs> to myself with you know and them too. But um, but it it, it can happen. Um, and some some clients are will not allow themselves to be that vulnerable. And um, I think you have to. I think you have to say that that's okay. Um, yet as a communications counselor, we, ha we get really intimate down to, um, telling our clients what to wear, you know, if there's food in their teeth, like, cause we're, you know, we're helping them with their presentations. Like you, it's a very, a very kind of intimate role, um, totally. you know, working in, working in communications and helping someone tell their story. Agreed. Um, agreed. So to go back to the original, the original story, it's like the story with their story. It reminds me of Hamlet, but it's the play within the play near the end. So you have yeah. the story within the story. But to go back to the original story, so first lesson that we can get from this is we have to build this trusted personal relationship so they, so they can um, let you know and understand what's really happening so these things don't blindside you. A second lesson from your original story is that things can change really, really fast. Right. And that's something I didn't appreciate 15 years ago, but, uh, but things are going amazingly and then it's dead the next day and sometimes the exact opposite uh, as well. Yes, I, I think that um, even more so today than 15 years ago, and particularly with COVID, uh, I yes. think the lesson that we can all pull out of COVID is that you cannot, we, we couldn't stay the course, who could? Um, and you have to be prepared strategically, emotionally to change gears. And when that rapid change happens, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things are swirling. There's a lot of confusion and doubt. And, um, if you are able to be the voice of reason and say, here's our action plan, here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to test it for X amount of time and set super clear, just super clear direction. Because sometimes at the beginning of, of intense change, you can't even set clear goals. You don't even know what they're going to be. You just, uh, particularly after COVID, you know, during COVID, you, you know, you, you can ha have a sense that this change will help. Um, but you got to be ready to step in and sort of be cool, calm, and collected. Um, my three, my three thirty Sunday calling client, we had that situation during COVID where we had one, uh, strategy in place for them, which was laying heavily to communicate. Um, they did very high levels. This was an organization. They did very interesting surveys. The surveys became instantly irrelevant the minute that COVID hit. So we turned to the marketing team and the CEO and said, okay, we're going to double down on thought leadership for you. Um, we're going to get your, we're going to level up your positioning where you're going to tell a different kind of a story where you become more of a leader and a guide. Um, and let's see if it works. And it did. Uh, we wound up uh, having him, well, 
a ghost wrote for him 15 right. stories. Um, he, he, wound up in the, in the, he wound up, you know, in the New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, um, you know, and on lots of TV shows. Uh, we had no idea, uh, I, you know, that, that this, that, the, well, we, we sense that the strategy, right. the, in, the tactics, tactically we knew it could work, but in terms of would what he, he was talking about resonate, things were in flux, so we had no idea but we just kept iterating um, and trying to create an, a level of confidence. Yeah, that, that makes sense. A third, a third lesson from your, uh, from your original story uh, as well is this. I think when there's, you're really excited about a project or a client, there's this instinct to just like obsess over it and do only that. And from the business point of view, for any agent, agency of any sort, it's always really risky to have like the one well client. And, and, and when it's something you're really excited about and it's going, going well, you just, it's hard to stop yourself from, uh, from, from, jump, from, from jumping all in. But cases like this are also a good reminder. Say, say hey, when all your eggs are in one client basket, that's, that's, that's a red flag. Yeah, absolutely. I um, I completely agree that you you can have you know X percent of your business coming from one client because you'll you'll be you'll be vulnerable. I mean, the business can shut down just like it you know tomorrow, a week after saying that it was expanding. And these things happen all, particularly if you work with high growth companies, and even if you work with um, like uh, you know we worked with a big multinational. Uh, company and the, the whole management team got laid off. So what as a as a communication, there was a shift. There was they brought in a a new CEO for the for the global company, and then there was a reevaluate a reevaluation and shift. So the we were working with one division and then expanded our business through the through the team at the one division and the president and the CMO, both of whom we were working hand in glove with, both got laid off. So so you know because they wanted to bring in new people. And that's frequently a reason why you're, if you're in a service business, your business can be in jeopardy. So you have to yeah. be always be prepared for that, always. Makes sense. I think these are the three main lessons that I can extract, at least in real time, uh, from, uh, from, from, your, from your great story. Are there any other lessons that you learned or things that you changed in, in how you do things as, as a result of this? Uh, uh, this chef experience? Well, I think, I think the lesson from the chef experience is that um, at the end of the day, things, well, I, there's, there's a saying in our business that like the minute you get a client is the, is the minute that you're going to start to lose them and you could lose them through a <laughs> variety of ways. So a, our take is to really be able to say, at the, no matter what happens, that we did a great job. And what does that look? What does that look like? You know, um, it looks like make sure that you're um, that you have a really good client relationships and they trust you. That you're bringing them constantly, bringing them ideas strategically that make sense that and that excite you. So, like when we were when we were negotiating with this Hollywood agent, that was something that we had experience doing, we enjoyed doing, and we knew that we were doing well by our client, you know, by with, you know, in that engagement. Um, and um, be a good partner, uh, no matter what. I mean, when they said we're, that we're shutting our doors, we're like, that sucks, let's go have a drink. <laughs> you know, like, I'm really sorry. Um, and uh, sort of so that you can walk or walk away, even even if a business is floundering, walk away knowing that uh, you held up your end of your agreement uh, in a way that made you feel good about the work that you were delivering. I, uh, I, I think that is a that is a great lesson. And uh in a positive and optimistic way to uh, to to end today's story, and um, a simple reframing of that or a variation of the point is you need to always turn lemons into lemonade, 
So, um, so even so even if it's failing, it, we can still have the have the relationship, and um, and always and always have our integrity. And as a result, hey, like the founder will have another company in a few years, and you, and you did a great job. So so maybe this one didn't work, but in five years, he gives you a call for something else. Correct. I mean, it's um, I I think it's all about building that relationship and that trust, and then um, and not and. and delivering on your promise, you know, as best as you can. Uh, so that's, and having a good time. I mean, you know, we're creative people. So, so, you know, a lot of, a lot of the excitement is in the, is in the, the ongoing creative output. I think that, I mean, to us, that's the most satisfying thing. And I think one of the real, for me too, as a creative guy, and I think one of the biggest challenges uh, for any creative person in business is to how to take the lemon to make lemonade. The, how do you like the part that's not fun, the bureaucracy, the paperwork, dealing with difficult people and like, how do you turn it around and, uh, and, 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 and make it fun? Yeah, well, there's, you know, you, you have to sort of accept that there's gonna be some, some pain. <laughs> along the way and just try and mitigate it. I mean, if somebody likes mountains of paper, you figure out a fun way, you know, maybe you learn a new skill to make your mountain of paper look prettier than the others or animated or something. I don't, you know, I don't know. Just, just, my, just, just give them packages that make them happy. My, my, <laughs> my general strategy is I try to make everything games because if it's a game, then, you, then that's fundamentally more fun and you can, and you can, you can gamify it and, and optimize it. So uh, it's what I do in boring conversations, especially. Right. Okay, <laughs> how do I make it fun? <laughs> Bonnie, th uh, thank you for coming. Great thank story. You. We got a, we got a bunch of uh, of great lessons, and I hope everyone watching this uh, 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 takes these takes these lessons uh, to heart. And uh, and th uh, thank thank you everyone. Thanks for having me. Woo! <laughs>